Welcome back to The Emily Show. Today, I'm breaking down a trial that you've probably heard a thing or two about that's going on in Georgia. That is the Young Thug Rico trial. We're going to talk about what Rico is, the wildness that has popped off in this trial already, and hopefully give you an overview as you are looking at stories about this case. Because not only did this case take almost a year of jury selection, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but we've also seen an attorney arrested involved in the case, a deputy arrested that was involved in the case, and much, much more. Well, hopefully walking away with a little bit of a better understanding of Georgia's RICO laws. So with all of that, we have a lot to talk about today. Let's get into it. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. Thank you to today's sponsor, Green Chef. You know how much Green Chef saves my life. It's basically the only way I eat dinner and a lot of days breakfast as well. Green Chef delivers incredible organic ingredients to your door with a photo step-by-step instruction on how to create a meal, most of them in just 30 minutes. And all the little ingredients you need for that meal are all packaged together. So you don't even have to think about it. You just have to follow instructions. And a lot of nights my team does that for us and it's fantastic. Not only does Green Chef have over 80 options to pick from a week, but they also fit your lifestyle from vegan or vegetarian to paleo to just looking for more balanced meals. I can't even tell you how good our sandwiches were the other night. We had incredible like Philly cheesesteak melts. They were just so warm and so hearty and were so fast to put together. So head to greenchef.com slash 60 Emily Baker and use code 60 Emily Baker to get 60% off plus 20% off over the next two months. Greenchef.com slash 60 Emily Baker and use code 60 Emily Baker to get 60% off plus 20% off over the next two months. All right, let's get back to today's episode. So as I said in the intro, my goal today is to help break down the legal behind this trial and then touch on some of the wildness that's going on. I am not covering this case streaming day in and day out, though if you are interested, let me know and I might pick up parts of this case to cover. Today we're going to look at a little bit of the opening statements and some of the things that happened there. This is going to be a long and contentious case that is going to last months. Um, And I'm worried they're going to run out of jurors because we're already seeing some issues in that regard. So this case is wild and it's a lot to dive into. So let's give a quick overview of what is going on with this Young Thug Rico trial. If you are not familiar with Young Thug, he is a Grammy Award winning rapper. He is um, an Atlanta based rapper. This trial is going on in Georgia. His record label, YSL, no, not Yves Saint Laurent, but YSL, his music label, the prosecution is alleging is a criminal street gang called Young Slime Life, not Young Stoner Life, or not the record label, but that there is actually a criminal organization that is a blood set gang, YSL. That's what the prosecution is alleging. The defense is arguing that this is not a gang, that this is a record label, that um, the prosecution is overreaching, and that they're not going to be able to prove their case. So let's back up to when this case started. In May 2022, Young Thug and 26 other defendants were arrested in an 88-page RICO indictment alleging over 55 charges for all of those defendants. And those go from murder and RICO conspiracy to assaults and thefts. The indictment alleges over 182 specific overt acts. We will talk about overt acts and predicate acts in a minute because when we get into the law of this, there's like RICO law and conspiracy law. And when we're in that realm of law, we've got different types of acts that count for different things and why they matter. (laughs) So we're we're gonna get into overt acts and predicate acts in a minute. A young thug whose given name is Jeffrey Williams is charged in only two of those charges. 
So out of the 55 charges, he is charged with two things, conspiracy to violate the RICO Act and participation in a criminal street gang. There are five other co-defendants on trial right now with Young Thug. As I mentioned earlier, jury selection in this case started in January 2023. It's December 2023. This trial started last week. Opening statements started last week. The very end of November is when opening statements started. That is how long jury selection took. I have never seen Never seen anything quite like that with the length of time it took to pick a jury. Yes, this is a high profile case in that one of the participants is a very high profile musician, but it's also going to be a very long trial. And we're already seeing delays in this trial. And we saw delays even during the jury selection process, delay after delay after delay. And then when you have multiple defendants, when you're dealing with six defendants in a case and all of their defense attorneys, you know, one person gets sick, it can stop the trial. And we are in the fall. That is not an uncommon scenario that a defense attorney or a prosecutor could get sick. A juror could get sick and not be able to continue. Um, people have car trouble. People have family things go on. This is a recipe for, for a very difficult case moving forward because they have 18 jurors. I was thinking with it taking that long to pick jurors. I'm like, do you have 30? Do you, you need all of them? 18 jurors were selected. They need 12 to deliberate. So as I said, jury selection started in January, 2023. The trial finally began on Monday, November 27th with opening statements, which were a little quirky. We'll get to that in a minute. When I mentioned that there had already been trial delays on Wednesday, there was an issue with the cameras and we've seen statements from law and crime that they don't operate the cameras i think that these are pool cameras from court tv it is not a hundred percent clear but i believe these are court tv pool cameras most trials are court tv pool cameras where the cameras are operated by court tv and then other networks can plug into those cameras and distribute the feeds from there but there is one set of pool cameras um operated by one network typically that network is court tv but the cameras were following a witness up to the witness stand and panned the front row of the jury box and images of some of the jurors were out immediately because this is being live streamed across multiple uh, platforms, including YouTube. So once you've panned across some of the jurors' faces, and we have seen this in other trials where jurors' faces have been panned across, one of the things with cameras in the courtroom, and we've seen this being argued in Idaho cases, and the court just took control in the Koberger case and the Chad Daybell case, the court took control of the cameras and are like, we're using the court cameras. We're kicking the media cameras out. No pool camera, no still camera, GFO, the court's operating the cameras. And what I imagine the court will do is kind of like a C-SPAN hearing where they have three camera angles or whatever, one from the back of the courtroom that doesn't show the jury, a fixed camera from the front of the courtroom, no panning, no moving, no issues, which is what we saw in the Gwyneth Paltrow trial. This is something that people have figured out, or at least some locations have figured out. In the Paltrow trial, there were fixed cameras that weren't panning and moving. Well, I guess they weren't 100% fixed. You saw some movement um, and some zooming in and some zooming out, but they were stationary fixed cameras within the courtroom. You could see when they depending on the camera angles, you could see the pillars holding up the, the smaller cameras in the courtroom. And we saw this in uh, Depp v. Heard as well, the more fixed cameras that switched camera angles, but didn't pan or zoom um, in that way within the courtroom. And I think when the courts take over, you're going to see an angle from an angle showing like the counsel tables and the podium who's speaking and an angle showing the judge and a witness and that's all you're going to get. Wide angles of the courtroom and hopefully better audio. Honestly, better audio is what I would hope for 100% over a more zoomed in video. But these issues keep happening. We saw it, I'm not remembering which trial we saw it in, but we saw another trial where they were panning uh, to a witness and showed some of the jurors. This happens. It seemed to be an error. I wouldn't imagine that this would be intentional. Cameras op absolutely don't want to get kicked out of the courtroom and don't want to put anyone at risk. The jurors' identities are supposed to be kept 
uh, sealed. However, the court proceedings are open. So somebody can walk into the courtroom and go and sit and watch. You can't photograph the jurors. They should never be videotaped, but people do see them. It's not as if they are shrouded or somehow hidden from public view in a public courtroom where people can go sit in the courtroom and watch. This courtroom is particularly cramped due to the fact that there are six defendants plus all of their legal teams in this courtroom. So there isn't a ton of room for observers, um, it seems from what I've observed online. But the that stalled trial pretty thoroughly. And what we're seeing now in coverage is that the cameras are zoomed in on um, the floor, a banister. They are sh not showing um, live video feed of anything in the courtroom. You're just getting the audio feeds out. I don't know if that will shift throughout the trial or not, but we are now potentially looking at months of trial with essentially only an audio feed. I'm surprised they're not just focusing on the seal of the state like they do when courts on break, um, focusing on the seal of the state and when there's audio, there's audio and then going to a dark screen when they're on break. But we'll see. That is a problem. Trial is supposed to be resuming on Monday after I record this, but before this goes live, we will see. The attorneys were not happy with it. The prosecution has brought it up multiple times that now they are worried because people online have said, oh, we know those jurors, um, that the jurors' identities are no longer as secure as they should be, and that that could potentially cause an issue for these jurors going forward. And after, what, 11 months almost of jury selection, I can't imagine how frustrated the court must be. The fact that the court did not throw cameras out entirely is is a little bit surprising this this judge has been a little spicy it's we're going to see one of those moments as we get into talking about opening arguments the court's been a little spicy with these attorneys and when we're observing anything in this trial please keep in mind the delays in this case have been so substantial that i think purely my opinion that this judge was frustrated with how delayed this case got before they started opening arguments based on the length of delay with the well, with the jury selection, with a defense attorney getting arrested, with a sheriff's deputy getting arrested, and more. So this case has hit roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. So before we talk about the RICO statute, let's just talk about some of those past roadblocks real, real, real quick, because you're, you're probably going, wait a second, Emily, I, I'm going to need you to back up and tell me what you mean by a sheriff's deputy being arrested. Um, in connection with this case. We're, we're going to do that right now. So this is coming from Atlanta News First. Former deputy arrested for inappropriate relationship with inmate. A Fulton County deputy has been arrested and accused of having an inappropriate relationship with an inmate. According to the Fulton County Sheriff's Office, the deputy is accused of willfully and intentionally violating her oath. She's reportedly connected to a co-defendant in the YSL trial, Christian Eppinger. Um, so we now have one of the co-defendants allegedly having a relationship with a deputy at the jail. It says that the deputy allegedly used Instagram and an illegal cell phone to communicate with the defendant and conspired with the defendant's relatives to bring him contraband. She had been a deputy since October 2022, and this all went down in June of 2023, so not that long ago. It, um, all things considered. So this prosecution is still ongoing for hindering apprehension or punishment of a criminal, violation of oath by a public officer, conspiracy to commit a felony, and reckless conduct. So that is ongoing, but that was just one of the hindrances in this trial. I also mentioned one of the defense attorneys getting arrested, and that attorney was bringing in to the court house prescription medication without its proper container. If you are generally, you don't try to bring prescription medication into a courthouse at all, but if you do, it needs to be in its prescription container. But it seems that when that defense attorney was getting arrested, and this is another one of the co-defendants defense attorneys was getting arrested. Another attorney said, do you want me to hold your cell phone? And the attorney that was being detained who had the, uh, prescription medication on them, went to throw the phone at the other defense attorney and hit a sheriff's captain. So was charged with the throwing of the cell phone, hitting 
the sheriff's captain, the other defense attorney saying this was an accident. He was being handcuffed and went to toss me his phone and it went awry. But that happened and delayed jury selection as well. We also saw co-defendants doing a hand-to-hand -hand of Percocet in court. One of the co-defendants handing that to Young Thug. And then one of the co-defendants also getting arrested for having weed in their underwear in court. So there has been delay after delay after delay. But when you've got this many defendants and a trial this large, delays are to be expected. Those types of delays, I I've never seen kind of pile up like that. It's quite a lot of wild circumstances at once, and that's before this case ever hit trial. Thank you to our sponsor, Lomi. Not only can Lomi reduce the amount of trash that you are putting out onto the curb to how stinky your trash cans are, but you can also turn your food scraps into dirt to help nourish your garden or your plants during this time of year. We use the Lomi for all of our food scraps, but it actually incentivizes my kids to scrape their dishes before they go in the dishwasher when they don't finish a meal. It's also helpful if you have travel or holiday travel coming up and you just haven't been able to finish those last few Thanksgiving leftovers. Now is the time to let them go. But if they're going into the Lomi, they are going back into your environment in a really natural way. Or look at Lomi as the perfect gift to give to the person who has everything because the Lomi is such a unique and interesting way to reduce your waste around the house. So whether you want to start making a positive impact on the environment or just grow a beautiful garden, it's time to try Lomi because it is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash Lawnard and use promo code Lawnard to get $50 off your Lomi. That's L-O-M-I dot com slash Lawnard to get $50 off your order. Thank you, Lomi, for sponsoring this episode. Let's take a look real quick at this original indictment from May 9th, 2022. This is the state of Georgia versus Adams. Adams is the lead defendant in this case, though there, as I said earlier in the show, were 27 total defendants arrested and 55 charges. Um, and those charges are the conspiracy to violate the RICO Act, which is Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act under the Georgia statute 16-14-4C. Murder, armed robbery, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, two counts of that, theft by receiving stolen property, violations of the Georgia Controlled Substances Act, two counts of that, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, participation in a criminal street gang, theft by receiving stolen property, armed robbery, two counts of that, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, two counts of that, hijacking a motor vehicle in the first degree, possession of a firearm during commission of a felony, two additional counts of that, participation in a criminal street gang, three more counts of that, violation of the Georgia Controlled Substances Act, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, participation in a criminal street gang, armed robbery, hijacking of a motor vehicle, possession of a firearm by first offender, prohibitioner, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, theft by taking, attempted murder, two counts, possession of a firearm by a first offender, two counts, possession of a firearm during commission of a felony, possession of a firearm during commission of a felony, two counts of that, two more counts of participation in a criminal street gang, one more count of attempted murder, a possession of a weapon by an incarcerated individual, two more counts of participation in a criminal street gang, possession of a weapon by an incarcerated individual, possession of a telecommunication device by an incarcerated individual. These are things that occurred while in custody. Another count of participation in a criminal street gang, conspiracy to commit a crime, another count of participation in a criminal street gang, another count of murder, two more counts of participation in a gang, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, three more counts of that, and then conspiracy to commit a crime, and the final count is participation in a criminal street gang. Most of the other defendants have pled or been separated out of this case, so that is why we are only seeing six of the 27 total defendants going to trial here. And as I said, with regard to Young Thug, it is only the two counts of the RICO conspiracy to violate RICO and participation in a criminal street gang prosecution, essentially alleging that 
he is one of the top participants in this criminal street gang, YSL. Now, when we talk about the RICO Act, I think is helpful to talk a little bit about why RICO as a federal statute and a state level statute was started. Emily, are we doing a whole legal lesson? Well, kind of, we're doing a part of a legal lesson. RICO was originally intended to root out mafia crime, which doesn't, you know, criminal organization crime, whether it be mafia crime, criminal street gang crime. We've seen it used in other cases with musicians when we're looking at the R. Kelly prosecution, though different types of criminal behavior, much different types of criminal behavior alleged in the R. Kelly case, but using the the music career is kind of the criminal organization. The thought of the RICO statute and the goal of the RICO statute was to uh, be able to go up the chain and prosecute those at the top of an organization, not just those committing the crimes on the more kind of street level crime, the ones who might be directly involved in uh, the robbery, the murder, the carjacking, or what have you. The thought being that they're, when we're dealing with organizations, are kind of those at the top of the organization that might not have their hands in it on the street level, but are still organizing it, benefiting from it, directing it, and are the ones really in the position of power. So RICO was made to take down organizations that are operating operating this way and get to the top of those organizations, not just prosecuting each of the individual crimes. And as I read out this list of crimes, not just prosecuting the two murder cases or the participation in the street gang cases, putting them together and prosecuting those involved in the entire organization, even if they're not the ones committing those individual predicate crimes. Hopefully that makes sense. We've seen this expand in the civil RICO context too. If you follow the pop culture stuff, there is a RICO civil case against Tom Girardi, Erica Girardi, and others of the attorneys alleging that that law firm was operating as a criminal organization and essentially um, in that Ponzi scheme way of stealing money from you know, the incoming clients to pay off those that were complaining and, and keep the money funneling that way. So in Georgia, we're going to pull up the Georgia statute real quick and just take a look, and then we'll talk about the difference between overt acts and predicate acts because they are both at play here because we're dealing with a conspiracy to commit the RICO Act and the conspiracy being simply the criminal agreement to do the thing, the RICO Act being the thing. So when we look at Georgia's RICO code specifically, it states, it shall be unlawful for any person through a pattern of racketeering activity or proceeds derived therefrom, so either through the pattern or through monies coming from criminal activity, to acquire or maintain directly or indirectly any interest in or control of any enterprise, real property or personal property, that's subsection A. Subsection B, it shall be unlawful for any person employed by or associated with any enterprise to conduct or participate in directly or indirectly such enterprise through a pattern of racketeering or subsection C, and this is what's charged in this case, it shall be unlawful for any person to conspire or endeavor to violate any of the provisions of A or B. A person violates this subsection when one, he or she together with one or more persons conspires to violate any of the provisions of subsection A or B of this code, and any one or more of such person commits any overt act to affect the object of the conspiracy. So we will talk about the conspiratorial overt acts. Two, they endeavor to violate any provision of subsection A or B and commits any overt act to affect the object of the endeavor. So that's the subsection one is the conspiracy. Subsection two would be the direct involvement, not just the agreement and conspiracy agreement with the overt act. It would be doing the overt act versus conspiring and somebody else doing the overt act. So that's the subsection C1 and 2. And the pattern of racketeering activity is what needs to be proven in Georgia. So they are going to be trying to prove that uh, YSL, not Yves Saint Laurent, is a criminal street gang, blood sect street gang that engages in racketeering activity, racketeering activity being the predicate racketeering acts. Gang statutes also have predicate acts saying criminal street gangs participate in these kind of crimes. There's a lot of overlap between that because they're arguing essentially the same thing, that there is a criminal organization and they do acts in furtherance of the criminal organization. And so the RICO acts generally line up pretty 
consistently with what a gang statute would also allege would be those predicate acts. So in Georgia, you have to prove the pattern of racketeering activity, but you don't necessarily have to prove the organization is the thing. In this case, they're going to have to do it either way because they've alleged so many charges of participation in a criminal street gang. So they actually have to prove that YSL is a criminal street gang. I just thought it was an interesting quirk to the Georgia RICO statute that you don't necessarily have to prove the organization, even though these prosecutors will have to do it for this case. So what is meant by a pattern of racketeering activity? And we're going to look at the Georgia definition. The um, underlying crimes here that count as crimes for the racketeering um, statute can vary by jurisdiction, but not a ton. So when we're looking at pattern of racketeering activity in Georgia under Georgia code 16-14-3, it is engaging in at least two acts of racketeering activity in furtherance of one or more incidents, schemes, or transactions that have similar intense results, accomplices, victims, or methods of commissions. So it's looking for that pattern of activity. And racketeering activity means to commit or attempt to commit or solicit course or intimidate another person into committing a crime which is chargeable by indictment under the laws of the state involving. And this is all of the different predicate acts, not the overt acts, but the predicate acts that count under the racketeering statute. And I, again, a lot of these are going to overlap with what types of predicate acts are in a criminal gang statute as well. Um, but the first one, not so much. The first, the first one in Georgia harkens back to a different time. I don't suspect this would be in their gang statute. Maybe it is, but unlawful distillation, manufacture, or transportation of alcoholic beverages definitely harkens back to the um, hearts of the RICO statute and the old, the older style of criminal organization um, and prohibition days criminal organizations. So, the number one predicate act in Georgia is. Um, is moonshining or bootlegging alcohol. Um, the second one is records or reports of currency transactions in violation, so money laundering in violation of 11, Article 11, Chapter 1, Title 7, uh, violations of the Georgia Uniform Securities Act, homicide, assault and battery, kidnapping, false imprisonment, prostitution, burglary, smash and grab burglary, arson and explosives, bombs and explosives, theft, robbery, criminal reproduction, and sale of recorded material. Your RICO Act includes copyright infringement? Uh, okay, Georgia. Um, uh, okay. Uh, the Georgia Residential Mortgage Fraud Act. So when I said not all of these are going to line up with a, a typical kind of uh, gang act, some of these would be uncommon in a gang act, um, including residential mortgage fraud. Forgery, illegal use of financial transaction cards, use of an article with an altered identification mark, so your kind of financial forgery crimes, Georgia Computer Systems Protection Act, identity fraud, bribery, false statements and writings or false lien statements against public officers or employees, impersonating a public officer, attempted murder or threatening witnesses. And it goes on to include influencing witnesses, evidence tampering, intimidation, threats, uh, all different kinds of weapons acts, drug acts, uh, payday loan violations, insurance fraud, and other types of felonies. So ranging from violent crime to financial crimes will count as predicate acts. What you might have seen in opening statements is one of the acts that is an overt act that they are arguing Young Thug committed was running a car that was then used down the road. Those overt acts are acts in furtherance of a conspiracy showing that an agreement was made and then you were taking acts towards that agreement, different than predicate acts, which are underlying criminal acts that can be punished that are part of showing the pattern of racketeering behavior. So overt acts can be non-criminal acts that show you're acting in furtherance of a conspiracy. Predicate acts are criminal acts that can be punished that are part of a pattern of racketeering behavior. And in this case, you're going to see um, those talked about because, of course, we've got the Predicate Act crimes over 55 different charges in this case, but there's over 182 different specific overt acts in furtherance of the conspiracy to violate the RICO statute that are laid out in that indictment. For example, one of the 
um, overt acts is from, you know, September 9th, 2013. It reads in the indictment, defendant Jeffrey Williams, an associate of YSL, did commit the felony offense of theft by receiving stolen property when he possessed property to wit a firearm, the property of Ann Phillips, that Williams knew or should have known was stolen property. And so it goes on and lists these acts and the overt acts in furtherance of the conspiracy here start in 2013 and go through April 28th, 2022, which is a week-ish before they filed this indictment May 9th, 2022. Now, because we are dealing with the allegations that YSL was a criminal street gang and the defense that this was a record label, of course we're going to have to talk about music. And I think it's one of the more controversial things, or at least one of the more discussed things about this trial. Are you looking to treat yourself to the best bras and shapewear on the market to take maybe the pinch out of the holiday party season? Today's sponsor, Honey Love, has you covered. Yes, the pun is intended. Two things that I love about Honey Love. One, when you look for their power shaper short, it does not roll down on you when you go to sit or stand. So you're not constantly adjusting your shapewear because nothing is worse than constantly tugging and pulling on your shapewear all night long. You just want to be able to sit and stand in comfort, knowing that you feel a little bit more snatched. And it's the same with their bras. They smooth out any bulging in the back, but you are not constantly trying to reach behind you to pull down the side of your bra under your glorious holiday outfits. So whether you are looking for shaper for the holidays or just the best bra to wear under a t-shirt, as I said before, they've got you covered. So treat yourself to the best bras and shapewear on the market and get up to 20% off site-wide this month only at honeylove.com slash lawnard. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please let them know it's from The Emily Show. It's time to ditch that uncomfortable underwire for good with Honey Love. Let's get back to today's episode. The use of music in trials is not new. Um, music has been used in trials. California actually just passed new laws in 2020, end of 2022, middle end of 2022, regarding the use of song lyrics in trials. There is a push-pull between the use of music lyrics, um, particularly rap lyrics in trial, or whether or not that is protected art, First Amendment speech, and it cannot be used against you in a trial, or is it a party admission to a crime? So is every lyric from every young thug song coming in in this trial? No. But the judge ruled not that long before trial at the beginning of November that numerous lyrics would be allowed to be used in this case. And it was lyrics that the prosecution could more clearly tie back to specific instances. So if you are, um, and it could be a song, it could be a book, because we've seen books come up in several of the criminal cases I'm covering right now, including Corey Richens, who is alleging that her Walk the Dog letter is part of a fictional book. And with regard to Keefe D, writing about being one of the only living witnesses remaining to the Tupac murder, this is kind of synonymous between whether it is a book, whether it is a song lyric, but when you can tie it back to specific instances of conduct, it comes out of the space of hyperbole, out of the space of being an analogy or a story and into the space of potentially lining out the way something was done, the intent behind an action, a crime, it could be a, a viewed as a confession, and that is something that these parties are going to be arguing about quite a lot in this case to see what the jury believes. As we talk about opening statements, we're going to talk a little bit about how much the prosecution leaned into some of these lyrics and what the defense is going to have to do to get around them. So lyrics, even if they are violent lyrics, if they are more abstract, more overarching and broad, those might not be admissible in a case, but when you have things that lean specifically into locations, instances, times and places, people together, and you can tie those back, then you might see them being admissible in court. And it's something that will continue to be discussed as we see things set on social media, whether or not they are hyperbole or story, um, or whether they are directly relating to something. As you see people try to talk around things, to maybe not have it used against you. And with the rise of social media, 
in the overt acts uh, that are listed, we see a number of Instagram posts and other things posted on social media. So yes, the words you say, whether you say them in song or in book or on social can be used against you at trial, but there are some limits to not using it so broadly so as to almost make it impossible to to sing about anything. And this that crosses over genres of music. But I, you know, if you've got somebody saying generally that they're rolling around with guns, you can't necessarily go prosecute them and be like, well, they said they were, and it's illegal for them to have one. That's not going to be quite enough. So like most things in law, it's going to depend. And in this case, not all the lyrics the prosecution wanted to come in will come in, but a lot of them will, which is going to paint a different picture of the defendant than what the defense is trying to paint. And we will talk about that in opening statements because the defense has really gone a long way to be like, this is a record label. And it'll be interesting to see if the defense leans into the lyrics being like, this is part of the record label. This is part of a an image. This is part of a recording artist persona. This isn't literal. This is persona. But that said, the opening statements were kind of wild. When we get into the opening statements of the prosecutor, there were numerous objections and delays, and the opening statements ended up taking place over more than one day. But the first one was the judge getting really fiery at the attorneys over the fact that the parties were supposed to turn over their opening statement presentations, whatever their PowerPoint slides were going to be, to the other parties. And it seems that at least as to Young Thug's attorney, that had not been done. And he objected during opening statements and the judge got so angry about it. And we're going to take a look at that exchange right now. Also, just note, like most trials, the audio seems to be recorded via potato. So the prosecutor was in the middle of making her opening statement. The defense objected. The jury was excused to discuss the objection, and the defense attorney has come up to the podium. Let's join this in court. Your Honor, last week... This is the defense attorney speaking. Two weeks, three weeks ago, you ordered the parties to share all of their displays in opening statement to the others so we don't have to have these interruptions. I did that. The state shared with me four attachments. That's all they had. That's what I got. What you just saw on your screen, if you don't remember, I'll ask the state to put it up and I asked for it to be marked as exhibit, is what you already excluded. It states that Mr. Ryan was convicted of murder and I represent the co-defendant who's not on trial on the appeal. How did that not get sent to me so I could bring it to the Sambo Court's attention? One, and two, how do we just violate court orders? So yes, I have a serious motion for a mistrial because it's intentional misconduct. So the defense attorney has said to the judge, I have a motion for a mistrial and how are we just out here at opening statements violating court orders? You ordered the prosecution to turn it over and that wasn't done. That's my motion. All right. And I'd like the screenshot to be um, captured for Mr. Weaver to put in the record. I'll admit it is, is uh, next court exhibit in order of the state's presentation anyway. So. And that's the judge speaking. Right. So that'll be, that'll be court one for purposes of the trial. So Ms. Um, Love, um, what's, your, what's your response? To the court's now going to the prosecution to hear what she has to say regarding this issue. Mr. Steele's assertion about the Mr. Ryan. As it relates to Mr. Ryan the and talking. the exhibits that the state intended to play and to um, display for the jury, I sent to Mr. Steele and everyone else the pictures and the photographs that I expected to use. Um, as it relates to um, the slide to which Mr. Steele is now referring regarding his representation on appeal, I'm not certain if the objection goes to the fact that there was the conviction because that's part of the indictment and that's part of the evidence that the state expects will show. Or if it's as to his objection about the fact that he represents Mr. Ryan or Mr. Blaylock on appeal. Don't represent Mr. Ryan. Mr. Blaylock, man. Excuse me. I never said this ever. That's it. 
the defense attorney is now not at the podium, but back by counsel table and is talking about who he represents on the appeal that is part of the issue, though the bigger issue, I think, is the failure to turn over the items. So what's your what's your objection based upon, Mr. Steele? And that's the judge. Uh, objection based upon, I argued this before the Senate report. You argued the prosecution that before they ever mentioned my name, you granted this motion. That I did. You brought him up to this honorable The defense is further away from a microphone and is not up at the podium, but he said, my name, the defense attorney's name, my name was not allowed to be brought up in connection with this. The court granted that motion and the prosecution in their opening statement is saying that I'm representing one of these other uh, individuals that is alleged to have been convicted of one of the past acts. And the prosecution is saying it's proven that they were convicted of murder. And he's like, that's on appeal. So that's part of the issue here. Court, outside the presence of everybody, we're an opening statement I am lied to. I am saying that. I am lied to. I don't know if anyone else got that exhibit. I did not get that exhibit. And I'm seeing everyone say shaky no. And now it goes against the court's work. We are bound, duty bound, to follow some of the court's work. He's like, I have been lied to, and now we're in opening statements and it's out in front of this jury. Join in the objection on behalf of Mr. Steele. Let me see the. Let me I can see. put it back up. Yeah, this is now the court speaking. And Your Honor, while I am putting this that is the back prosecution up, speaking, I will state in my place that initially, when there was the objection from Mr. Steele, I didn't have a clue what it was about because I didn't mention his name and didn't intend to mention his name. As I looked at the screen, I saw that part of his name was on the screen but for I the most part. But I mentioned that. Part of the defense attorney's name is on the slide that the prosecutor put up during opening. And the prosecution's like, I, I wasn't intending to say it at all, but now it's on the screen in front of the jury. Well, I ruled upon that last week. I did. I, yeah. We were not, I would take it as it came in this case. And if, it, if the evidence got to that point, then I would deal with it accordingly. Yes, Your Honor. So, um, and Your Honor, as to Mr. Steele's motion, as I'm pulling this up, the state would vehemently object to a mistrial and ask for a curative instruction um, and a reminder to the court, to the jury, that nothing that the lawyers say is evidence in this case. This is not at all the type of thing that um, rises to the level of mandating a mistrial. Certainly not. It just isn't. Um, I have the. All right. The prosecutor is working slide. to pull up the uh, slide. Now, I have it now. Court, I'm court about to share court the one for purposes of the motion for mistrial. The prosecutor has now pulled up the slide regarding the objection, and the slide talks about the other case, says murder, February 23rd, 2019, Ryan, along with YSL member associate, Damani Black, um, and then the DOB, he was 190, put a bullet in the back of the head of Jamari, aggravated assault, Rodney Uten, uh, by shooting at him with a gun, convicted case on appeal, represented by Brian Stee. So it says it on the slide. And this is why the defense was so frustrated that they didn't have the slides in advance because they could have argued it in advance. Okay, on slide uh, 11 of 65, that I see where you have that um, at the bottom, represented by Brian Stee. So, um, we can leave that for the time being. Leave it for the time being because it's it, it is what was it was it was up. I'm gonna just I'm gonna I'm going to uh, deny the motion for mistrial, Mr. Steele. But I will go ahead and give a curative instruction to our jurors at this point in time. So the court's going to remind the jury essentially that this is not evidence. This is the first of numerous times this judge has to give the jury curative instructions during opening, which is unusual. Yes, or re. This is the defense attorney. Next process goes on. I'd like you to do no courtesy, if you would, 
and allow me to do that now and preserve the motion for mistrial. You, you, you made your motion for mistrial I, and the basis, and I have marked the, I have marked the, I'm going to mark the whole state's presentation as is, as, as court one for the purposes of your motion, this and it will go in as, uh, as stated. And I have two other issues I'd like the court to just take out. One is just remember, I know you rule on it, but the state said earlier today that Mr. Williams is contacting through parties that they don't know to pay for other people's lawyers. So I think that this is the defense bringing up now other issues now that the motion for mistrial has been ruled on and this is right before the court starts getting spicy mr williams of course being uh this defense attorney's client young thug coupled with that exhibit and number two i like the court to now order prosecution to give me and anyone else who wants to see it i need to see respectfully what you ordered last week all of the displays of the state of Georgia that they have not, have not given to us. So what do you mean by the, what displays are you talking about, Mr. Steele? I never saw that. I never saw the wolf. I never saw um, the, um, the indictment. You ordered all the, I gave all my displays. I gave everything. The defense attorney has the microphones turned away from council table, probably so they won't pick up anything at council table while they're talking to their client, but has the microphones pushed away from council table, which is why he's a little harder to hear, but is saying, I gave all of the essentially PowerPoint slides or displays I was using in my opening to the prosecution. You ordered those to be turned over. The prosecution clearly has more shit that they haven't turned over. I'm asking you to order them to turn it over. Now we're in the middle of opening arguments. You ordered them to turn it over and we haven't seen it. I understand his frustration here hundred percent. Are oh, you talking about using for opening statements, sir? Of course. Okay. It should have been done. All right. It should have been done. I agree with the defense. All right, Ms. Love. Yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, two matters, Your Honor. Um, one. This is the prosecution. The first thing that Mr. Steele has requested of the court regarding the representation that the state made about other YSL members contacting Jeffrey Williams for representation is absolutely and has always been a part of what the state expects will show it. I'm going to deny that portion, but to Mr. Steele's point, uh, we, I'd already made that issue in terms of his particular involvement and anything you need to let me know prior to that. And you need, I need to rule upon it and also subject to foundation just like this so i assume that what you told our jurors is what you expect the evidence to show yes yes All right, so i'm gonna i'm gonna overrule that part of his objection what about the last thing you mentioned and your honor as to um the court's directive that we turn over anything or any exhibits or photographs that was my understanding of the court's directive that we expect to show an opening statement um as a matter of course, I can again reiterate the fact that it was an inadvertent um, omission to leave Mr. Steele at least part of his name on I got here. that, but he's, he's talking about, is there, is there anything else you're going to use in open you haven't shown to the defense counsel? He's telling us, sharing. He's, well, I said that. I told you to do that a week ago. Honor, because I, here's, what, here's what I told you was going to happen. I've got a jury yep. that's out right now that's being interrupted. Yep. And Ms. D. Williams, you should have made your motion or should have told me about that an hour ago or when you found out about it. Not hijack me at the bench about that. You did what you had to do, but I'm not happy about that. I'm not happy about any of this. Because this is stuff we could take care of before our jury comes in. And that makes you all you know, lessen your ability as advocates and lessen our ability for this for this jury to go ahead and get this case seamlessly. This is what I told you all was going to happen. So have you given them everything you're going to show them during opening statement? Your Honor, I haven't given them all of the word slides. This is in the middle of opening statement. The very beginning of a month's months long trial that has already been going on for for what 11 months 10 months in jury selection and now we are finally at opening statement and the judge 
is completely put out by the fact that the attorneys have not done what he's asked them to do, which is turn over your opening presentations to each other. And the DA is saying, well, I turned over all the pictures I was going to use in the PowerPoint essentially slides, but I haven't turned over all of the word slides. But if the word slides had been turned over, the slides with the words on them had been turned over, the defense would have seen his name in it and been able to object before you were in the middle of opening. And the judge said, look, defense, you should have brought this to my attention the second you realized it instead of throwing all this stuff at me while we're, you know, the jury's out of the room and we're not on a break and whatever. Um, but I think the judge's exasperation is better placed with the prosecutor at this point because he ordered the things to be turned over and that hasn't been done. I did give to them what Mr. Williams objected to. I had given that to them previously. I will give them or share with them the things that have been added as of this evening. And can you do that over the next five minutes? I uh, sure can. Ingram, can uh, sorry, Ingram, can you find out if our jurors are ready? So the court orders the prosecution to turn it over and um, allows the defense attorneys to review it. That is not the only issue they had that day in opening statements because the prosecution also made an argument that seemed to shift the burden on to the defense. This has been discussed quite a lot when it happened. We're gonna talk about what burden shifting means briefly. I'm gonna play the clip of what the prosecution said. And again, forgive the court audio. I don't, I don't know what microphones they're using. Potato. What you will not hear any evidence of is that the defendants were not involved in a criminal street gang. You will not hear any evidence that they did not commit crimes on behalf of YSL. And as I stated to you earlier, what I'm saying to you now, this is let, not, me, let me object to that statement, a, please, as burden shifting. Object basis? Burden shifting. And um, under Parker versus the state. <coughs> this is the defense objecting. 277. 277. Why don't we take that out there? 39. I'll, I'll note your objection. I'm sustaining the objection. Why don't you rephrase, madam? Uh huh. Uh huh. I'll yes, sustain the objection. Here's what burden shifting is the prosecution bears the burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that all of these defendants did what they are saying that they did. The defense does not have to prove they didn't do it. She is arguing you're not going to hear from them that they didn't do it. That's literally exactly what you cannot do because the defense has a Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, to not incriminate themselves, and they are not obligated to prove they didn't do it, to disprove it. The prosecution must prove it beyond the reasonable doubt. The burden lands with them. And the judge gave another instruction to the jury reminding them of what that burden is, that the things that the lawyers say is not evidence. But this is not off to a good start for the prosecution. Yes, they won some big rulings with regard to using the song lyrics, but these types of issues and opening statements uh, worry me for what is going to come for the rest of the case. And also this prosecution team is up against not one defense attorney, but they are going to trial against six defendants. So they have six defense attorneys who have their ears turned in to what this attorney is saying. And you are going to get these objections objected to maybe more swiftly than if it was just one defense attorney paying attention to multiple things going on. Um, I think we will probably see more motions for mistrial as this case moves forward because of the things we've already seen early on here. But the burden shifting is a pretty egregious error for me in opening statements. The defense is not obligated to prove everything. And after winning the rulings with regard to the uh, lyrics and everything else, if your evidence is that strong, there's no reason to stand up there and say, what you're not gonna hear is that they didn't do it. You're not gonna hear anyone argue that they aren't members of the gang. That's completely inappropriate. One of the things that they did argue during opening statements were song lyrics. And they were putting them up on, on slides and reading them to, to the jury before the defense attorneys gave all of their various opening statements. One of them that directly on point to trial, which is take this shit to motherfucking trial. I rep my life for real for slimes, you know, 
I kill. Those types of lyrics are going to come up again and again in this trial, because if they are arguing it's just a record label, what do you mean by kill? Because there are multiple murder counts in this case and previous murders that were convicted that are tied into this case that the state is going to try to argue are part of the criminal organization. That lyric goes on to say, I done beat it twice, state. I'm undefeated like the feds come and snatch me. So it's going to be interesting to see how much the jury resonates with the defense argument that young thug does not in fact mean thug, it means truly humble under God, and that photos the prosecution showed that they argued were the defendant throwing gang signs or actually not him throwing gang signs. He was making a P because he is pushing P and that stands for, according to this defense attorney, pushing positivity. But that is nothing in comparison to the defense attorney that argued essentially that her defendant is a filler character in a bad two season anime arc. Yes, that actually happened in these opening statements. And I see where the argument is going, but I don't know the age of this jury. And if arguing that these are anime filler characters is going to resonate with this jury well or not. They're like, the prosecution jumped the shark with my guy. He's just filler. The defense attorney actually said, grab some popcorn, sit back and watch the circus. And you know what? This case may well be a circus. It already, in just week one, has shown itself to be that. So because I fear you might not believe me about the anime side arc of the opening statements, I appreciate this attorney's point. I don't know if the jury will get it, but she makes the point that her client is a side character because he is only charged in one of the counts of this 50 odd count indictment with 20 plus defendants. And why are they picking on her guy? He's just a side character. And this is that argument. Indictment. This reminds me of this anime named Bleach, where it's 16 seasons. Every episode is about 18, 20, 20 episodes. Sorry, every, yeah, every season is 18 to 20 episodes. And they have season four and five. They have these bouts. They're the villains of the whole thing. It was season four and season five. The main characters are trying to get them out of Soul Society. You go to season six, you don't hear about the bounce. You go to season seven, you don't hear about the bounce. Why don't you hear about these important characters? Because they're filler characters. It's a filler season. Me and Rodalius, we're fillers. We're not integral to this story. They just drag him out of prison to jail to make this bigger than it has to be. We're basically distractions. So, as a juror, what can you do to tell the state, we're not going to be distracted. We don't need to listen to filler. You come back at the end of this with a not guilty for Rodalius Ryan. You tell them we do not want to waste our time on fillers. We just want to get to substance. So I guess sit back, enjoy the show, get some popcorn, because this is not justice. This is a circus. Thank you. And in such a large RICO case, this is not justice. This is a circus. It will be interesting to see how the jury feels because we've already had opening statements interrupted multiple times where the judge had to admonish the jury and give extra instructions because of behavior of the prosecution. So I realize it's very memeable. And, and in a case that can feel like a circus, you're like, and now we've got an anime side arc. But the argument is solid. The argument is solid in that the prosecution, if they continue to show that they are violating court orders, if it seems to the jury that they're overreaching, then this argument may become more powerful. Or by the time we get to closing arguments months from now, she may be able to tie it back around and said, I told you to get some popcorn and that we were side characters. And now here we are. I want to know what you think about that too. So between all the shenanigans that happened before trial to the fact that we are now having issues with the cameras in the courtroom. We have every witness cross-examined by six different attorneys. This trial, when they say months, is going to be months long. Months long. 
If these types of check-ins on this case, while I am not doing live streaming coverage day in and day out of this case, are helpful to you, if you'd like me to follow this case more, if you would like to see some live court coverage of key days of this trial, please let me know in your comments and on social media, and we will take a look at that. Because as we said, this is going to be, this is going to be ongoing. I'm very interested to see what happens when they come back to court on Monday, if there are any new arguments with regard to cameras in the courtroom or things that have happened on social media. I've seen photos on social media, not just screen grabs of the jurors' faces, but of people in the audience in court taking photos of themselves um, and things like that. So I'm not sure what this court is going to do to lock it down, but we will see next week. So with all of that, you know, May your Wi-Fi and your larger internet be stable and plentiful while you are trying to stream or whatever you're doing, holiday shop. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your family be well. And may the odds be ever in your favor. All right, Law Nerd, I'll talk to you in the next one. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search your app store for Law Nerd. And you can also follow me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. Remember, I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I recap all of that for you in quick bits on Monday. And of course, The Emily Show drops on Wednesdays. Thanks for being a Law Nerd.